So I'll just just a short intro. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for your uh, kind offer to to join us. And uh, you thanks know, for your invitation. Share. Actually, otherwise this wouldn't have happened. So <laughs> so that's so cool. We're, we're looking forward. Then you know the, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now, um, by any chance, yeah, I want to make a comment. Uh, uh, all my guys uh, at Caltech know the bigger the crowd, uh, the better my presentation. I'm exponentially, proportionally uh, um, excited to make a great presentation to more people. So uh, sometimes I say if there is not enough people in the room, just call homeless people from the street and fill it in. <laughs> but these are all experts. So, And you see, I'm not afraid of your questions, right? So, you know. Take a seat also in the front. Oh, girls, come on over here. You, you're a welcome guest. In power electronics, when I started, there was only one girl, and she was my PhD student, first in the United States, Case Medley. OK. She's actually my official assistant, so. OK. Um, any pointers, laser pointer? Anybody has a spare laser pointer? I'm sure you do. And what I'll do is. Uh, yeah, in some way I want to, I can see this, and so you can see me talking, uh, all right? So, so here it is. Uh, this is a circuit which um, I will explain in more detail later, but basically what it is, if you think about it, you know, it's a bit confusing now, but imagine uh, here, from this point to this point, when this is L magnetizing, it is actually tapped inductor, all right? But funny enough, it doesn't work as a tap inductor. It works as what I call a hybrid transformer. And what it means is uh, uh, converters existed, uh, tap inductor back, tap inductor boost, which are uh, there to get additional step down or step up. They were well known, but they had a huge problems. I think there was uh, hundreds of papers written that the people wanted to do, take, use a tap inductor from 12 volt to one, and say use a turns ratio of tap inductors to, to step it down. Hey, we've done it. We can do then 50% utility ratio. We don't have to get, go to 0 0.002 to get the 50 to 1 step down, right? But the prob there is a big problem with the tapped inductor. So imagine here, this is a inductance. And imagine across this inductance, one inductance, one uh, inductance up to here and connected to the diode. And the diode is connected to the other inductor. In other words, it's like a two tapped inductors, but of course, they have two magnetizing inductors. The question is, where was magnetizing inductance? It's right between input and output. This is like a total, when the switch is turned on, main switch is turned on, current goes this way, charges this capacitance, and through this inductance goes to the output. Now, uh, next time when this switch is turned off and this one is turned on, listen, uh, uh, look how this current, this voltage, uh, this uh, MOSFET is in series with a diode. That is typically what we call a voltage bidirectional switch, which means it can conduct, a, as a voltage bidirectional switch, can conduct the current in only one direction, because the diode is telling it you can go only there. But uh, it can block the voltage of both polarities, OK? Anyway, so the point is, the cri critical point is that this diode is here is in, in, a, in a series with the, this. And what happened is, Transformer, like every transformer, including outer transformer, has uh, built-in leakage inductance. And I would tell you, uh, and you know, maybe the, my uh, fellow professor would dispute that or not, but I don't think there is any other converter at the moment that the leakage inductance of the transformer is taken, is taken as a part of fundamental basic circuit operation, and it's not causing the problem. All switching converters which have isolation and so on, they have a leakage inductance, leakage inductance, one half Li squared, whatever is leakage inductance, I is a peak current when you turn it off. So you're not allowed to turn off uh, uh, the, the leakage uh, inductance current because it's proportional to that generates losses times the switching frequency. And since everybody is crazy and going on a bandwagon of uh, five, <laughs> two megahertz and they're promising 10 megahertz soon, you know, that's that much more you know, losses. So if it was 5%, it becomes like 40% in, in the 10 megahertz, okay? So uh, imagine this inductance will actually be our leakage inductance uh, or transformer, which is really resonating with this capacitor. That's why we call it all resonant, but they said all resonant is transformer leakage inductance, okay? So we are charging this capacitor this way, and we are discharging it in this loop. Remember, there was one uh, winding here, 
and another one in here. And imagine this is just one to one terms ratio and the dot connections are right, right here and right here. If there's one in here and another one in here. So, uh, having said that, uh, first of all, what is uh, 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 one thing that would be unique uh, also, though I call this transformer is not your tap inductor transformer, is because in this loop here, there is one capacitor. If you remember a true converter, how in a true converter, when I split the capacitance in two series capacitors and put a magnet as in inductance, you know, all the simulation programs don't work, you know, with my true converter. You know why? Because you, 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 they put a perfect model of a, a they have put a model which works for half bridge, full bridge, push pull, etc. Why it works there? Because it's a square wave voltages which are forcing volt seconds, and there is no. Uh, you can make a model of a full bridge, any full bridge converter with a no magnetizing inductance. But if you do that and apply that model uh, uh, to a true converter and without magnetizing inductance, what happened? Magnetizing inductance really is uh, determining what is the split of DC voltages of two series capacitances, okay? So it's needed. You can't have it without it. Okay, you can, but then you'll get a wrong result in the simulation. And I pointed out to a bunch of these companies that was working with a simulation software program, and they fixed it, and now they have a program where it includes the magnetizing inductance, no matter what it is, you know, you know, 10 millihernia or a very low uh, current, but it's needed to, because that magnetizing inductance with the two capacitances provides a volt second balance, which determines what is the split between the two voltages compared to the uh, non isolated case. Okay, the same thing applies here. What happens with this capacitor here? It's not determined. Who is going to determine it? And it's one of those things, you know, you, you have a consequence is actually uh, resulting in a, in a, a solution. Okay, I think there are a couple of more guys, good. Okay, take a seat. Uh, Although it would be nice to have a standing room only, but I think I like a standing, a sitting room only. <laughs> so, so sit down, relax, and enjoy. You know, okay. And if there are no no more seats, even can you take care of for uh, extra uh, chairs because uh, we don't want to. There is room uh, on a table to put extra chairs. Okay. What I'm trying to say here now, uh, and trust me, <laughs> this is correct because I've done it many times in a scope and in a simulation. What happens is when this voltage. Uh, when this switch is, uh, say, this was turned off and this switch is turned on, turning on a diode, and now the current goes this way and the current goes that way. So diode current splits into current in a, in a let's say, primary of tap inductor and it goes in a secondary of the tap inductor. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that's, uh, that's missed. <laughs> okay, we'll fix it. Uh, these primaries are supposed to be here and the secondary is there. All right, so it's just like a drawing problem, okay? <laughs> so we can fix that. But trust me what I say is correct, okay? So now, uh, when you have this voltage here, then voltage, if it's one-to-one -one turns ratio, then the voltage is reflected here, and then in this loop, it's what I'm saying, uh, I'm deriving the rule which is really consequence of that. Since I put this here, there is a resonant inductance, right? And this voltage is some uh, reflected, vo this voltage is some reflected voltage here, DC, vo DC voltage, and this DC voltage. In this loop, resonant inductance has to be volt second balance during this, only during this period, that's when it lasts. And because of that resonant inductance has to be balanced, what has to have? This capacitance DC voltage has to be equal to the voltage which was reflected here. Now, let's take about turns ratio. If I have a turns ratio 3 to 1, this voltage here, whatever is output voltage, 3 times that is reflected on the primary. And what's voltage here? 3 times the output voltage. You know what? I'm making my own circuit, you know, because of position of the circuit, I'm, and I'm saying there is a resonance here because of the resonant inductor, then these two voltages have to be equal. And you know what? When you eventually make a resonant circuit, what happens uh, in a loop? You have one DC source, but I'm saying is it's equal but opposite. If this is plus minus, this is minus plus because that in a loop you cannot support a DC, right? A, a resonant inductor. Let's call it a, a volt second balance on resonant inductor. During that off period, resonant inductor cannot support any voltage, so these DC voltages have to equal. And I just explain you why 
this was free to choose, because, just like in a chukon world, where before magnetized inductance were dictating split, here resonant inductance is dictating what that DC voltage on capacitor is, which is great, because then what it does? In that loop says, these two DC voltages are opposite uh, value, and how do you get next equivalent circuit? You DC voltages cancel, and what's now equivalent circuit? <laughs> that equivalent circuit with the capacitance, which has a, a zero DC voltage on it. It has it's just resonance, okay? Uh, but we know there is a fixed DC voltage on it, but to analyze it, it is just a capacitance value and, uh, and uh, resonance inductance. So these two are forming resonance circuit with one uh, square root of LRC and, and so on. Now, <coughs> another important point uh, to notice is that this diode simply says I will no never conduct a current which is negative. And this current is always positive. And when this current splits in this way, and this way, what it says, the output inductor current, output load current, cannot go negative. And I'll show you the way from there. I'm just giving you the broad picture, and then after that, I'll give you the detail. You know, it's like uh, looking at the forest first to get fully understanding. That's why the lectures are so much more valuable than uh, reading the book or, or so on, because I can point out your first order and then second order and so on. So the first order is basically that uh, uh, this uh, resonant circuit uh, have a certain resonant period, okay? And let's agree that that resonant period is 50% due to ratio. I think they have a, a, a also 50 or 60% they'll have, let's say at 50% due to ratio, and let's say uh, uh, switching frequency is 25 kilohertz, like this case, and that's like uh, 40 microsecond, half of that is 20 microsecond. Well, let's say they make this resonance 20 microseconds. And during off period, it is just resonating. It cannot go negative, and I just started the key point why that is important. Because uh, as you start, uh, that means that the waveform on the output always ends up at zero and never can go uh, uh, lower. What happens, the output also, you will see it, it has, uh, uh, when you change a load current, load current is actually exciting resonance and telling how much current, peak resonant current it was to take. So basically, if I, uh, so the sudden change of step load from uh, 10 amps to 100 amps, well, this resonant current on the output will just reduce uh, sine wave magnitude 10 times or increase it 10 times. Next cycle. No, no more needing for a full, you know, eight, eight um, parallel buck converters to get the step load change. And to start with, I'll tell you, you know, that's my feeling. Buck converter in itself is so bad, and now having it 8 times, trust me, it is real bad. Okay, <laughs> so, so now, um, when we do this, uh, then uh, step, for one thing, by definition, step load change will be fantastic. And I don't need a megahertz or two megahertz. I can do 100 kilohertz because whatever frequency I do, next cycle you will see it. I had actually some simulation, and they can do it. I, I think we'll do it next time, maybe by the time the show starts on the five, or first case tomorrow, we'll have step load changes. You'll see what I'm talking about. So basically, it is really output current is exciting how much it wants to take next cycle, and the transient is really right there, you know, in one single stage. No more many stages, etc. Second, uh, okay, uh, no, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, point out the waveforms. Uh, um, one, uh, one top waveform is a, a switch voltage. And you see it goes from here. Uh, this green waveform is output. And do you know what is actually a conversion ratio? It is a conversion ratio, even though you see all these resonances all over the place, but conver uh, converter operates at a constant switching frequency variable duty ratio. And you know what's conversion ratio? Uh, can you go back to the previous one for a second? Uh, you see here, you have, a, a, if you have, for example, uh, one turn and one turn, like tap inductor with one turn and one turn after the tap. That is considered in here as a total of two, because it's a total line, it has the two turns, and one turn is going to the output. So you really use a tap inductor as a two to one step down, okay? So it is stepping down the converter uh, with a two to one just because of a transformer or auto transformer, tap inductor. But when it operates due to ratio D, it has additional step down of D times two to one. So what's happened here? 50% due to ratio and two to one, that's four to one. So what's happening? Uh, if you see on a waveform, 48 volt output becomes 12 volt output, okay? And it's due to ratio control, no problem, all right? Uh, can we uh, now on this one, uh, 
show that, uh, can you increase the duty ratio? Yeah, so we can Actually, we can, we can the, uh, or change the, change the duty ratio to a little bit bigger, right? Because it was like point, uh, 0.2 or 3, can you increase it to 0.5 or something? No, it is 0.5. Okay. Uh, you know, they're switching for your explanation. I, I learned that much. They can do dynamic simulation, unlike a, a software simulators, which get you steady state, end of the story. They are simulating it all the time. And that's why I can have control of uh, hardware in the loop because they can, uh, simulation is given at any time, the instant when this was happening. So they are now switching from this uh, dynamic mode to the static when we can just see the waveform. And the difference that will be visible is because when the waveforms are shown in a thin line, they didn't implement it yet when I asked them, <laughs> you know, then, uh, then it's a dynamic simulation. And when you have a thick line, because I don't see very well, so, <laughs> so then, then it's going to be steady steady state uh, simulation, it doesn't change. So, uh, can we go back to... Uh, okay, uh, I think what, what was... That's another thing what happened. We were kind of having only a couple of days to do that because... Uh, and it's happening from Novi Sad, transferred to here, to Boston, from Boston to here, so, so I think you can understand there was a lot of, uh, you know, um, grieving uh, guys there working till the uh, morning, and I originally I asked them to do the constant switching frequency, <coughs> variable duty ratio, actually this implementation, what they've done is uh, they went step up and made it a constant off time and variable on time. Why is that is good? Because look, and, and I'll tell you one thing, General, and I'm so annoyed with the whole power electronics field and everybody and power electronics journals are publishing the papers with uh, the guy adds to standard PWN converters or resin doesn't matter, more inductances, more capacitances and of course now he has to uh, exchange the energy between them and what happens? Here's a converter, it has a eight switching intervals and has a five modes of operation and you're looking through that and I said if I see any paper if I were editor in this magazine I would see any paper which has more than a three switching intervals but the third one is really nuisance like here a uh, dead interval I would say throw away paper and don't even look at it okay that's my point and and that's really happening now even with my converter, some people looked at it, analyzed it, and put it as a eight sub-intervals. You know, it's, I just thought, this must be a joke on me or what. But anyway, the point is, you see the three intervals. So go back. Go back. Uh, can you uh, put one enlarged, okay? What is the third interval? The third interval is just a dead time before this reaches zero. How about if I, if I make this switching frequency that it just, uh, that the uh, off period is just equal to the resonance, okay? And then I keep that fixed constant and change the duty ratio. Isn't that just a two switch, uh, two, uh, two uh, sub intervals? Nothing to, of course, there is a more efficient way because what happens? Once you have a, a resonance finished before, well, you, you're dealing with the average of this, which is total charge. So now when you have a, we'll cut it off, the RMS current of this will be larger than if I had RMS current spread over the whole interval. Agree? Well, I looked at it, I measured it on, uh, on a <laughs> Skype, uh, no, simulation software program. It's, uh, it's hardly noticeable. It's not even worth dealing with it. You know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, so, uh, so basically, constant off interval theoretically is most efficient. You have this dead time interval, but Constant switching frequency, very duty ratio is just as good. And you know what happens? You know, I'll tell you when you make a constant switching frequency, just imagine. If I change here, increase the duty ratio on time and keep the frequency constant, you know what happens? It's like, a, it's, it's fun to watch. You know, you see here, this coincide, turning off on main switch, or grounded switch, essentially starts a resonance at zero. And then turns it off, whatever that resonance period I uh, designed, okay, resonance interval. And then if I increase this interval, what happens? This edge moves further and it pushes this in front of it. <laughs> you know, it goes, 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 until it goes to what? Until it goes basically to, to this end. Now, does that have any problem? 
After that, no, because after that you could have uh, really a resonance finished a little bit earlier and uh, this current, uh, you know, the negative current will be providing, uh, um, I say, zero voltage switching on, uh, on uh, other transition, natural and so on. So basically, uh, <coughs> this, this is a preferred mode operation, what engineers like. Constant frequency, no EMI over wide range, constant uh, uh, noise, etc. Now let's go back to the circuit itself, okay? And you see here, these guys, and I, I, I like their system, they don't use a, t a separate, most of the time they draw both switches when they're in a high side configuration as one, okay? So you don't have to, and then it's already with the built-in then time and you show what it is daytime, rather than going to separate switches, separate drive and so on. But anyway, this is already set in a high side configuration. You define a dead time and go back to the waveform. Let's see what happens. You see here, uh, I think uh, you had some uh, others uh, where, where it shows more, uh, more uh, do you see that is a trapezoid? Okay, can you enlarge that or? or uh, yeah, just show one pulse because they are repeating. You just show one pulse, you can expand it. Huh? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that I, I hate in a simu software simulation program, and I made one um, uh, speed up of one simulation program uh, about a million times, and I avoid all of this uh, million calculation, and I go to last 10 one. It's like a delivering, a, uh, the, I say, package from New York with a drone to front of my street, and then the last five steps is just going to number of my, my house, okay? So I avoid all of this million calculation which cause accumulated error. You know, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's PC or whether it's now fasted i7 processor. It's, it's just nonsense to go from million calculations to, calc to uh, how you say, uh, in increase your uh, uh, error. And then, of course, you do minimization and minimization has a global minimum. So the whole thing is totally, I say, unnecessary, okay? It's a better way of doing it. So I hope I'll do this with uh, my fellow Serbians, friends, and uh, a typhoon. Okay, more to come. So you see, oh, do you see here? What do you see? Trapezoidal edges. Do I need a software program, even software program, which will, you know, they say, oh, spicy shows the details of a transition and all the noise. Why do I want to look at ugly noise? I don't want to have it to start with. You know what I'm saying? And my transitions are always constant current. At the peak current of a, of a switch, which is alternating positive and negative, peak current is actually discharging uh, one node to the other, and the other peak current is doing a zero voltage transition on the other. So basically, it is just a constant current uh, divided by capacitance. That's a, that's a slope of that uh, discharge, right? Nothing to it. So why do I need a model what's inside? You know, <laughs> there's nothing in it. Nothing is happening there. Now, another point just for you guys uh, who are, you know, on this bandwagon, like uh, my friend, uh, Manfred from Infineon, they are introducing the um, uh, gallium nitride switches and everybody is on a bandwagon. We're going to do two, two megahertz, uh, two giga, no, two megahertz uh, converters with uh, gallium nitride, back on, I'll get to it, back converter which is 0.02% uh, duty ratio and so on. And I'm saying I'll take your ga gallium nitride switch anytime, any day, but I will operate it at 100 kilohertz. And you know why? Because at 100 kilohertz, uh, I will take advantage that gallium nitride has a 15, 20 times, whatever it is, a uh, uh, lower drain to source capacitance, right? That's why it can switch in five nanoseconds, but I don't want to switch it in five nanoseconds. I switch it in a five microsecond if I need to, okay? But I'll use 10 times, 20 times lower drain to source capacitance because what is this discharge? I over C, okay? If C is small, how much I need I to discharge? Not much, 10 times less. So basically anything will do, if I use a gallium nitride instead of MOSFET at, uh, at 100 kilohertz, I, I will only need the magnetizing current on my transformer to do the zero voltage switching, okay? None of this huge current and it'll do it at no load, full load, at anything you want, okay? So that is where this field is going sideways and it's had been going for the last 50 years. 
And I think when I'll get to it, I already made a point, and nobody on this power management company has yet listened to me, but I'm hoping that after a couple of my presentation really get through to the engineer, someone is starting questions that why we are doing this, okay? And uh, I, I plan for this conference to make this presentation, and uh, you know, powers to be uh, decided uh, that I'm not worthy to make this presentation, so, so be it. I made a presentation, another uh, paper which was going to be, and it's now posted anyway on my website, and I made another presentation which is going to be uh, switching at 2 megahertz, why so high, okay? Which means we can do everything at 100 kilohertz, and, uh, and especially if you do at 2 megahertz, well, they don't know, under understand the transformer. So if you go to two megahertz, okay, maybe you can make a one turn inductor and, you know, and maybe you go to 10 megahertz, you will eliminate the core, magnetic core. But your transformer will be lousy because the transformer will be operating at a 10 millitesla AC flux wing and it has a 500 millitesla capability, okay? So this is just a you know, shame because it's a, a really, a, they don't understand the basics, you know, because they derate so much flux and I can use a full flux wing of 200 millitesla and 100 uh, uh, plus minus at 100, uh, 100 kilohertz frequency and so on. So you don't gain any advantages, but nobody really knows magnetics anymore. You know, if I were ask half of a power electronics engineer uh, who invented the transformer and, uh, how, and, and I will fail most of them, actually, the, even yesterday on a dinner, uh, I passed it and he correctly said uh, Faraday. Okay, so, so that's, you know, good point. Uh, and he's a, and you know what? He's a PhD from MIT, you know. You know how the Caltech always wants to bug MIT, but here, credit to MIT, okay? Um, now, let's go, uh, what else? Let's, let's now, I think uh, uh, you've seen it. This is the dynamic because of thin waveforms, you see? And, oh, I didn't go through all the waveforms. So you see, this is a switching uh, uh, switch. Uh, yeah, if you put it on, uh, do you, uh, okay. I think, uh, is this now dynamic or is this a, uh, huh? This is, uh, that was a capture. So is oh, is it capture? But it doesn't come with a thick line. I kind of I, I lied. I told them when it's thick lines that it's uh, static. But anyway, okay. Yeah, you can see what it is. So uh, hold on. Ho uh, it's good. You you show a few cycles. So uh, but no, I don't want that. I want all four of them on, a, on one uh, lined up. You know because the whole point is the uh, timing. So this is a main switch, on and off. Uh, this is a, a um, resonance discharging. This here is actually that magnetizing inductance is really charging. And then, uh, during the second interval, and I didn't even manage to explain you, during the second interval, resonant interval, what happens with magnetic inductance? In the model, that's what's unique about this hybrid transformer. Magnetic inductance in an off interval is shorted. There's no inductance. It is, you know, like, a, what do they put here? Um, 25 microhenry or something versus, or, or you know, 70 or whatever microhenry. That magnetic inductance is shorted. So therefore, that's why you have a loop which is only a resonance. There is no inductance in Sirius or anything, okay? So it's a unique, and uh, just give you a blurb about it, which I'm kind of uh, proud in a way, and you can uh, read in my uh, patents. I will put all three patents, two patents here. Um, I, in the patent, I explain in the detail uh, that there was a transformer, which, as we now know, uh, it's out in open, Faraday invented. There was a tapped inductor, which uh, Mr. Tapped Inductor invented, or Dr. Tapped Inductor, whoever he is, but we, nobody is accredited with this. And he had a basic problem, so I guess that's why nobody wanted to, <coughs> to, <coughs> to claim the uh, ownership. And there is this hybrid transformer. And I will get to the waveform and we'll see it and explain it. <coughs> hybrid transformer is actually hybrid, that's why I call it a hybrid. It's a hybrid of two things operating together. And I'll just give you the verbal thing so you can understand it. And I'll give you then uh, the waveform which you explain. What it means is this. This transformer, if you, uh, if you have a tapped inductor, it acts as a tapped inductor. And you know what? Tapped inductor does a step of the change of the current. If it is like 2 to 1 like this, you know, a current will be going from one level at 50% UT ratio and twice the level at... at uh, uh, the rest of the interval. So basically you have a two to one step. That's bad because when you have a sudden step change, the only thing you can do is, uh, how you say, put a, some kind of a snubber to kill it. But you are killing it. It's not even like a leakage inductance in a transformer. It's a half of energy stored in that tapped inductor has to be killed. 
because that's what it is stored. You understand? Okay, so that's one thing. So you have a step change in, uh, in the current. So that's what a tapped inductor does. And in this circuit, it does as well. Step down the voltage with two to one and uh, step up the current. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that was it. But, and it has a step in a, at the instant of switching. Now, what, here comes an AC transformer, uh, Faraday's transformer, which is superimposed on it. And you will see, if you go back to the circuit, just to explain uh, initially, uh, go back to circuit for a second. Uh, you see here, L and C, just like in a true converter, this primary cannot have a DC current, right? because it's a resonant current, all right? And this resonant current comes from here and uh, comes here. So primary is an AC current, which is good for a design of a transformer because only DC bias comes from output, which is one turn and 50 amps. One turn and 50 amp is 100 amp per turns, right? A 50 amp per turns, 20 amp per turns takes about one mil or two. Well, great, you know, you only have uh, two or three mils uh, for 50 amp, one volt, right? But the other thing which is also clear, if this is a two to one step, uh, listen, if I have a 10 to one step down in a transformer, what happens? 100 amp on the, uh, let's say 50 amp on the output becomes a five amp on the primary side. So voila, I don't, I'm having one turn inductor on the output which carries all a, a huge 50 amp current and on a primary, this uh, bad uh, uh, energy transfer capacitor in a chuk where everybody was shooting, that one has only 5 amp RMS current. How much you need to put that, you know? You can put a 50 volt cap here, if it is 50 volt input, you can put a uh, 20, or if the output is like a 10 to 1, this will be, say, 2 volts times uh, 10, it's 20 volts here, it will be 20 volt cap, and uh, you can use any 805 chip capacitor with a 3.3 amp ripple current and put two of them in it, and that's done. So, the, who carries all the weight? Uh, this resonant capacitor, but they're not on the secondary side, they're on the primary side, okay? And they're practically nothing, okay? So, uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's one thing, uh, and then what I was going to go after uh, here is, um, well, that's now, let's now go, and I think it's time, you've seen it, uh, all that, let's go now and set up my uh, view graph, and I'll uh, then step by step explain how I came to that uh, circuit, okay? And through that explain uh, uh, the process. Now, one, one more thing uh, that I would uh, say here is, uh, yeah, I think it's better to have a circuit so it's easier to just go from one to another. So let's have a, um, those who came uh, late, you know, you didn't have any breakfast, you know, help yourself for a five minute, let's have a five minute break. And those who didn't have enough, help yourself and I'll set up the, the, my computer and projector and uh, we'll get it going, okay?